talk. Um, this is Mark Chase talking about the globe trotting plant genus Nicotina, which is tobacco. Um, Mark's a retired former research scientist from who worked at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, and his interests there were focused on plant classifications, with particular interests in orchid evolution and on the wild species of tobacco. So with that, that is probably enough for me. I'm going to stop sharing and we will hand over to Mark to explain all about nicotina. Okay, should get it here, there we go. Is that coming through now? We can see it, you were very faint when you spoke. Is that a little better now? Yeah, I think that's a bit better. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you um, for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, it's uh, always a little difficult to know how to pitch these kinds of talks to groups that you're not very familiar with. I do know some of the members of the of the society. Um, my interest in this group of plants came about because I'm interested in the particular things that they do. That is there's a lot of changing of chromosome numbers uh, in this group and I'm, I've always been interested in what factors are driving that process in plants, uh, in this uh, genus in particular. But I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to talk about what we had to do, the framework we had to develop in order to um, be able to study this phenomenon in these plants. And I think they're just intrinsically interesting because of what they've been doing. And this is where we get the globe trotting bit. So uh, let's see here, go on to the next slide. I, I should start out by mentioning that this, like many research projects, is not simply a matter of me doing the work. Uh, it's quite a large group and I'm gonna be talking about the results of the studies that a, a large number of people have contributed to. In particular, um, I'd like to mention the cr chromosome work has been done by my, our, my Brazilian colleagues and the uh, phylogenetics has been done by uh, people in Vienna. And also I've had a lot of support in the field work because we've been doing a lot of trips to Australia to collect the plants we've been studying. And we've had funding from various uh, sources. And in particular, we've been growing the plants at Kew and this uh, has been done in the quarantine house. Uh, and this is uh, just because they're members of the Solanaceae and their worries about viruses ending up in the UK getting into particularly seed potatoes. At any rate, an introduction to the family uh, and to the, to the genus Nicotiana. Uh, most people are familiar with the group. It's um, most diverse in the Neotropics. Uh, so South America is where most of the species occur. Um, there are also some in Western North America and I'll get onto that distribution a little bit more. But this is seems to be where the most diversity is, but they are worldwide in distribution. Many, of course, important agricultural species here, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, aubergine, Cape gooseberry, you can go on to quite a number of minor fruits eaten in various parts of the world. And med medically important, uh, in particular, the most used, abused drug in the world, tobacco, uh, is a member uh, of this, of the genus Nicotiana. Um, the particular group I'm gonna talk about is not all of the species in, of Nicotiana. And I'm gonna talk about this one section, uh, section Suaviolentes, which is found in Australasia, where there are about 60 species, one species in Africa and several on Pacific Islands. About 65% of the species in the genus are, are allotetraploids, and I'll explain what that is in just a moment. But this is the fourth largest genus of the Solanaceae, the family of the tomato and potato. Allotetraploids, this is why I'm interested in these plants in particular. I, I won't dwell on this very much, but just to explain a little bit of the basic biology. Here we have uh, two diploids. These are normal uh, plants that have 
received one pair of chromosomes from each of their parents, the male and female uh, plants. Uh, Tomentosiformis and Sylvestris, which are both South American species, and they hybridized and gave rise to Nicotiana tobaccum, which is the, the commercial tobacco. However, it doesn't have 12 pairs like they did. Each of these two parents contributed double the normal number of chromosomes. And so this is an allo tetraploid. Allo meaning other because the parents are two different species, not members of the same, uh, same species. And it has twice the number of chromosomes it should have, diploids being two pairs. This has 24 pairs. So many of the species in this genus, Nicotiana, have this kind of origin. And this is what I was interested in to start with. I keep hitting the wrong button there, sorry. And this is a phylogenetic tree. And you don't have to worry about the details here, but we know these uh, what the parents are because we can match the copies that are present into the maternal and the paternal uh, copies in this phylogenetic tree. So the two parents, Sylvestris and Tomentisiformis, being diploids, only show up in one place on the tree. And the allotetraploid tobaccum shows up two places is where the two arrows are because it has a copy from its mother, which is Sylvestris, and a copy from its father, which is Tomentosiformis. So it's a hybrid, but it has double the number of chromosomes that the parents that gave rise to it did. And we can also see this. This is called chromosome painting. This is the chromosomes unpainted on the, on the left. And then we label the DNA of one of the parents and use that as a probe on those chromosomes and you can see that half of the chromosomes are lit up. So we have some that are labeled yellow and some that are labeled uh, unlabeled, which are the orange ones. So you can see that the two parents are there as well. So again, there are various ways we can determine that these things are these allotetraploids, these hybrids with double the number of chromosomes that their parents have. Now, polyploids, You've probably heard of polyploidy. This allo, allo tetraploid is a form of polyploid. They're very important for our crops. Things like strawberries, maize, and wheat are all polyploids. Something about having these increased numbers of chromosomes gives these plants an advantage and makes them ideal crops. And we use these extensively. We're not entirely sure why being polyploid is advantageous as to a crop, but there is a clear association between polyploidy and increased yields. And so we make use of these things as our crops, but many plants are polyploid. Now specifically in Nicotiana, here's a, just a little bit about how they look. Uh, in terms of their habits, they can be herbs, small herbs. Well, most of the ones I'll be talking about today are small herbs. But some can be trees like this Nicotiana glauca. Uh, they don't ever make very big trees, but they can produce woody plants. And in terms of their floral morphology, uh, there are a lot of them that are swinged moth pollinated, like the tobacco hornworm that was behind um, our host in the beginning. Um, and these have these white flowers with long floral tubes and their pollinators have long tongues that go into them. But there are some here that are pollinated by butterflies, some that are pollinated by bees, and interestingly enough, a group of them that are actually pollinated by uh, bats, uh, which is quite an unusual thing for a herbaceous plant, but they are pollinated by bats. So there's a diversity of floral form there, uh, but they're the ones I'll be talking about today are almost entirely of these white tubular types. Now again, the distribution of Nicotiana uh, is broad. We have a lot of them in, this, in South America and then another group in North America, but the group I'm gonna be talking about today principally is found in Australia, 
with one species in Namibia, a few in New Caledonia and Tahiti, and then one species out in Fatuiva in, the, in French Polynesia. Now, when this distribution was first looked at, uh, the common conclusion was, well, these, this is a typical Gondwanan distribution for a plant spe uh, genus, because Gondwana was made up of South America, Africa, and Australia. And here we have these species in all of these areas. And so this was thought to be a very old group of plants because these continents were not close enough together for easy dispersal since about the last 90 million years. So this would put the origin of the genus Nicotiana back in the time of the dinosaurs before the uh, KT extinction about 65 million years ago. Now this, to some of us, didn't seem very likely. Uh, it didn't seem like this genus should be that old, but we didn't have much evidence uh, about how this distribution was achieved, uh, but it was assumed in the beginning that it was due to plate tectonics, that they were, had evolved before the Gondwana land broke up, Gondwana broke up, and they just rode the continents and achieved this distribution by moving along with the continents. This was thought because the seeds, although they're small, there's no particular reason why these things should disperse very well. But we now know, and I'll go into the evidence in, in, a, in a few minutes, that these seeds actually do disperse well. Not clear how they do it, um, but we used an approach called a molecular clock to evaluate the ages, the age of this group. And the way, one of the ways of doing this is to look at sister species pairs, one on the mainland and one on a con an oceanic island, volcanic in origin, for which we know the age. And if we know the age of that island, we can say that if that species uh, pair, um, the one species reached that island, it could not have been more than the age of that island. So we have two such pairs of species on a mainland and the oceanic islands. In the first case, we have Cordifolia, which is endemic to Masafuera, which is well off the coast of Chile in, in South America, and its sister on the mainland. And then we have another pair uh, that's on the mainland of Mexico, and another uh, close its sister species out in the Revejeguetos Islands, uh, which are more than 300 kilometers off the coast of Mexico. So we can take the differences in the DNA of these species and assume that the, uh, the, these, these species pairs diverged uh, at the time they one dispersed out to this island. So we can date that split at the age of the island, knowing that it could not be older than that. And if we use that approach, we get an age for this species pair that's uh, we can use then to cal to cal excuse me to calibrate the molecular clock, and it tells us that the age of this pair must be 1.2 million, which is actually the age of that island. And if we use this to calibrate the molecular clock, it gives us 2.4 million, which is the age of this species pair in South America. So these two are mutually corroborative, and then we can use that amount of change across the whole of that DNA tree that I showed you earlier uh, to calibrate the amount of change that's taking place in that, across that tree. And we can then determine that the age of the section Suavilentes, which is in Australia, uh, Namibia, and the Pacific Islands, cannot be older than 7.5 million years. So that's really quite different estimate from what people are assuming if this distribution was achieved through plate tectonics, which would have made them 90 million years old. This fits better with what I had believed was more likely anyway, but we didn't do it just this way. We also did another method, which was to use a, a secondary calibration point from another study where they looked at the ages across the Solanaceae family as a whole. 
And if we use that as a calibration point for Nicotiana, that would be a minimum age because it's based on the occurrence of a fossil. So we know a group has to be at a minimum the age of the fossil. We come up with basically a bracketed estimate here that it couldn't be more than 7.5 million years, but it has to be at least 6 million years old from the secondary calibration point. So we've determined that this was a very recent uh, phenomenon. This distribution was achieved very recently. So using that molecular clock approach across the genus as a whole, we could see that the evolution of the genus in South America was largely coincident with the Andean uplift, which has taken place in the last five to 20 million years. And in particular, this section Suave Alentes, which is the one that I was saying was globe traveling or globe trotting, dispersed to Australia, French Polynesia, Namibia about six million years ago. And once it got into Australia, it somehow figured out a way to, to live in the arid zone, which is of course the majority of the, of the continent of Australia is arid and cannot be used for growing crops. And then it did this business in the Australian arid zone about 2 million years ago. So now we can say that using these molecular approaches, we know the timing of these events and we're sort of left with the, some, the idea that they must have somehow managed to get there on birds feet, which there aren't that many birds that could travel across those distances. But we have the evidence they did it and we know that it happened within the last 6 million years. And about the only way this could happen was if they managed to get there on birds feet. And a colleague of mine once said, well, with enough time and 6 million years is still quite a bit of time in geological time sense, it's yesterday, but uh, it's still a, a long period of time. And with enough time, rare events are a certainty. So they've done it. Uh, we can only assume that they did it on bird's feet. There's no other possible explanation for how they managed to get that distance. When the seeds are, as I showed you before, the seeds are small, they're less than half a millimeter, uh, and they could be carried by wind at some distance, but they're too big, they would fall out of the wind column, could not make it across the oceans by uh, on wind, very likely. Okay, so, we know that this group, the section Suavilentis, is globe trotting. They have managed to get great distances very recently. And then we set out to study this group, and we've made uh, field trips from 2013 to 2018. And here's showing Australia the dots, different colored dots representing the different years uh, and the areas we visited. One of the problems with working on a group of plants that occurs in Australia is that it's a big continent and it takes a long time to collect the material you need to do the studies. You need, we needed fresh material seeds in particular so we could grow these plants. You have, in order to do chromosome work, you have to be able to grow those because you need root tips or flower buds in order to count chromosomes. So we had to collect all this material. Fortunately, we discovered at a fairly early stage that uh, herbarium specimens collected within the last 20 years often have viable seeds on them. So we were able to increase the distribution and number of collections we had by taking seeds from herbarium specimens. And we have about a hundred additional accessions that we're able to get by using this process. It seems that like many plants, the seeds of Nicotiana can sit in the soil a seed bank for many years until the right conditions occur and then they germinate. We don't know how long they can live in the soil, uh, in, in the seed bank, in the soil, uh, but at least one accession that's 50 years old still had viable seeds that we could germinate. So it, uh, it probably is up to 20 or 30 years easily that these seeds sit in the soil uh, waiting for the right conditions to germinate. And it's that ability to sense the right conditions and germinate that has allowed them, we think, to enter the center part of Australia into these arid zones uh, and speciate there. Now they occur in these arid zones in a variety of sites. 
But this is quite an unusual thing for a group of plants to move into an arid zone. In every other case that has been studied where we've used these molecular clock, clock approaches to be able to know when events have taken place, the groups that are in these arid zones were there before they became arid and slowly over time adapted as these areas became drier. Uh, but these members of this group, Nicotiana, section suaviolentes, went into the arid zone after it formed. The arid zone in Australia has been as dry as it is today uh, for the last 7 million years. And I've said that this group only entered the arid, arid zone in the last 2 million years. So they entered it after it was as arid as it is today. And it's, we think their capacity to sense when there's been rain at the right time of year that has allowed them to penetrate this arid zone. So we have species like this one, Nicotiana valutina, growing right out in the middle of a sand dune in central South Australia. And the first time I saw this, I said, you know, what on earth is this herbaceous, thin-leaved herb doing out in the middle of the arid zone? And if you pan this back a little bit, you won't see another thin-leafed herbaceous plant in this, out the sand dune. But they have controlled their, the germination so that they have timed it, uh, so they get some uh, signal from the rain and the temperatures so that they know that this is a time of year when they can uh, germinate, flower, produce seeds, and then go back into the, the soil seed bank and wait again till the next time the right conditions uh, come about. Now we think that the, these plants probably started out in conditions more like this. This is Nicotiana benthamiana, which is growing here on the south side of what's called a breakaway, a rock, rock outcrop in the south, southwest of uh, western, excuse me, in northwestern Western Australia up in the Pilbara region. I'll come back a little bit more to the Pil Pilbara, but this is, we think, how they started out in the arid zone. In these sheltered spots, you get protection from the sun here. You also get runoff from the rock face. And in addition, uh, wallabies, kangaroos, and other animals spend the night in these same sites, so they leave their feces there, so they actually are getting some fertilizer. But some of these species then figured out how to control their germination and moved out into these open sites like this species does in the sand dune in South Australia. So when we started our project, we thought this was a nice, neat little group in the floor of Australia, which produced in 1983, there were just 17 species in this group in Australia. But between that time, 1983, and the start of our project in 2013, uh, additional four, uh, four species had been described. But during the course of our project so far, we have found that there are a lot more species out there than anybody ever dreamed. And we have about 60 species. I won't go into a great deal of detail about all of these and how we discovered them, but I'll give you some idea. These fall into what we call cryptic species. This is a category of species where there is not a great deal of morphological difference between the species. But when you look at their ecology and their genetics, you see uh, a disparity so that they're clearly different on a genetic and perhaps ecological basis, but they're difficult to tell apart on, a morph on morphological grounds. And the classic case of this kind of thing are these butterflies where the adults are almost identical for all intents and purposes and were considered just a single species. But when the caterpillars were studied, they found that not only were the caterpillars different looking, they actually ate different plants. And each one of these is a good species in its own right. We can't tell them apart, but they can do so very easily. Uh, and they don't make mistakes very often and produce hybrids. And here's this 10 species in a species comp, what had been viewed as a species complex in the Guanacaste conservation area in Costa Rica. Each of these caterpillars eats a different thing has a different ecology, but the adults had all been considered members of just one species. They're now recognized uh, based on their caterpillars as being different species 
but the adults cannot be told apart or very difficult to tell apart. And we think this is a similar process to what is going on here with these um, Nicotiana species. I can now tell most of these species apart when I see them in the field, but my colleagues in Australia and some in Kew look at me every time I say, well, this one's different from this one. They, uh, we don't see it, but I, I, I can see the difference, but I have to admit they're subtle. Uh, here's just an example of one of these uh, and, and why I think they have been difficult to sort out before based on, on their morphology. We're gonna go to Western Australia. There's where Perth, the capital of Western Australia is. And we're going to Kalbari National Park, which is up on the coast uh, into the tropical part of Australia. This is a national park with a series of stand, sandstone cliff and river, river gorges. And here's one of these coastal heaths. There's the Indian Ocean out there in the distance. And if you look closely, you'll know you're in Australia because there's a kangaroo. But in the same habitat, there are some plants of Nicotiana. Now these are only about eight to 10 centimeters tall. And there's not a lot of morphology to go on there, to be honest. And this is one of our new species. It had been classified with another species, which does grow in these same habitats. Here's the other species. There's the flower, isn't it, isn't it gorgeous? Um, cute little thing. Only some other could love it, I suppose, but I like them. At any rate, this is the other species. And they're very difficult to tell apart under these conditions. These are these plants can get a lot bigger than this. This is what happens when the, there's enough rain to get them to germinate, but then the rains uh, don't materialize and go any further. And these little guys just, uh, in many cases, forego producing the floral parts and just self-pollinate, make a capsule and release their seeds and wait till another year, hoping for a better set of conditions so they can get to their full size. The, both these two species get to about half a meter tall if I grow them in the greenhouse with nice compost and water, as much water as they'd like. Uh, but in nature, often this is all you see. And it's not too surprising that people didn't uh, realize that these are two different species growing in the same place. Now here's one other example. This is, uh, this had been considered all to be one species and it was called Nicotiana umbratica. Uh, and this plant, uh, when it's growing happily, gets to about a meter tall. And this guy had just been considered a depauperate form or de a depauperate um, example of umbratica, perhaps because it just didn't get enough water or enough moisture. Um, but when we saw these in the wild, I, I had doubts in the first place because this uh, they seemed to be growing happily in the place they were growing, and they were a fraction of the size of the umbratica. And uh, when we did the genetics, these were completely different. They're not each other's closest relative at all. Uh, so it's a case of uh, uh, people assuming that this was just the depauperate plant of umbratica. And we named it after one of the national parks where we found this, Karajini National Park. Uh, so it's a, a new species that we named a couple of years ago. And here's the former distribution of umbratica in northwestern Western Australia. And you can see, I think, that there are two clusters here. One is umbratica, and the other is our new species, Karajini. And these actually grow in some of the most interesting places I ever been on the planet so far. This uh, umbratica is found in the East Pilbara Craton. This is a bit of Earth's crust that is pre-tectonic. That is before there were continents, before there was continental drift. These are uh, 38,000 million years old, this piece of crust. It's the second oldest bit of the planet uh, crust that's uh, still in existence. The other is in South Africa. It's slightly older. And 
Abradica's distribution is confined to just the East Pilbara Craton. Carrageeny, very close by, grows in Precambrian banded ironstone in the Hammersley Range, a mountain range, uh, where there are deep gorges, whereas the East Pilbara Craton is quite a different type of um, formation. If you look up, here's a Google Earth um, image of Australia, you can see the East Pilbara Craton right there. That's this old, extremely ancient piece of earth crust. And here's the Hammersley Ranges here, where the other species occurs. You can see again here, here's the East Pilbara Craton, which is made up of granite outcrops in a greenstone matrix. And you can see this right here and centered where this place called Marble Bar is, where's a gold mine. This is quite rich for gold. And a lot of this area has been mined for gold for more than a hundred years. But you can see that bit of crust and that's where Ambraticus is uh, located. And this is what this area looks like. It's very flat, uh, but you have these granite outcrops and that what looks to be a ham with a slice right through the ham uh, is actually a five meter across boulder that had split. And if you clamber up and look in amongst those boulders, here's Nicotiana umbratica. And it's a one, another, another one of these species that takes advantage of being in and amongst these rocks to get protection from the harsh conditions. Uh, and it's only found in the East Pilbara Craton. And here's the Hammersley range where the other species, the one that's been confused with umbratica occurs. And you can see it's totally different. And if we go up along these rock outcrops, this is where you find Nicotiana carrageeni along here. Again, underneath over, rock overhangs where it's protected from the sun, so it doesn't have to deal with the worst of these environments. But this is a series of very, very beautiful gorges cut through this banded ironstone, which is purple and red. And uh, it's fantastic. It's, I visited this place twice. And I'd love to go back again. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Uh, but this is home to this new species, which is quite pleased with us. So this is the sort of point where I'm going to leave the story. There's a lot more to say about this group. Uh, we know, as I was saying, that these are globe trotters. They arrived by long distance dispersal from South America. Uh, reaching Australia, Namibia, and P the Pacific Islands, we assume on birds' feet. We don't think there's any other way it could have happened. Uh, the fact is, all of our evidence shows that these are a very uh, young group and that their arrival in Australia is only about six million years ago. They diversified into the interior, into the arid zone of Australia, uh, once they managed to figure out how to control their germination. We don't know how they do this. If I grow these in the greenhouse and I want to get good germination, I have to treat them with gibberellic acid, which breaks their inhibition. But I've tried all sorts of things to try to get them to germinate naturally. And these ones that grow out in the open just will not. I haven't been able to crack it. I've tried cooling them. I've tried giving them water at different times. I've tried cooling them, heating them, you know, the all different combinations, and I just can't get them to germinate. The ones that grow like Umbratica and Carrageeny that I just showed you in these rock outcrops are easier to germinate. Often can, I can get them to germinate without using gibberellic acid. But those that grow out in the open just have some sort of inhibition that uh, a very specific set of circumstances must overcome in order for them to grow. And that makes sense that something like that would evolve in these plants because they're living out in the open, out in what could be extremely harsh conditions if they happen to germinate at the wrong time. So they've controlled their germination to do this uh, exactly under a specific set of conditions when they can go through their life cycle before it ends up too hot and too dry for them to exist any longer. And all their, all, to me it's um, quite surprising that because of their young age, they've specialized in growing in some of the oldest pieces of the Earth's crust. It's just incredible to me to think that these, these species have become adapted to these very old places. You, you would think that given how recently they've evolved, 
that they would be less particular about where they grow, but they're not at all. They're very uh, particular about the places they grow. So it's an interesting group. And as I said, I have other interests in this, but I thought the story of how they got to Australia, when they got there and what they're doing there would be of interest to most people with any interest in natural history or, and botany. Uh, and with that, I'll end the talk. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Mark. That was that was fascinating, and um, far more than I, I, I knew. I said I was saying to you before starting coming into this, I didn't even know there was more than one plant in the genus Nicotina. So I, I've definitely learned something, and I'm sure everybody else has as well. Um, we're going to go over and take a few questions from people now, and uh, just a reminder: there's two ways to put questions. You can either type them into the chat below, and Anka will put some of them to Mark on your behalf, or if you'd rather come in and ask your question yourself, then the way to do that is to raise a virtual blue hand, which is somewhere under your participants options in Zoom, and I will call people in to put the questions to Mark. Um, so Anka, have we got any questions? We do have a couple of questions um, for Mark. So the first one comes from Stephen Olenda, um, who was curious about the fact that there's only one species across Africa, which he thought sounded a bit weird if there were so many, you know, for instance, in, um, in Australia. Yes, this is a, another one of these enigmas you would think. Uh, in fact, this one species is only found in two sites in Namibia. So it's not widespread. It seems that it has like, uh, the one that reached Australia, it, um, you know, it, it's managed to hang on. It, it seems quite incredible to think these things could uh, end up in a place by chance that they could grow and, and persist, but obviously they do. Uh, but the one in Africa, in Namibia, is still just a singular species and has had the same amount of time as the ones in Australia and does, has adapted to these, um, arid conditions, but like the ones that we think are the closer to the ancestral types in Australia, the one in Africa, which is named appropriately Nicotiana africana, uh, grows in rock crevices on the south side of these rock outcrops. So it, it's in these protected areas. And evidently, unlike the ones in Australia, it has not figured out how to uh, control germination so that it could escape into a broader distribution within Namibia, which is, if you look at the landscape, looks very much like these areas where we find them in the arid zone in Australia. So it's just another of these enigmas of evolution that something allowed these guys in Australia to do something different, and this has allowed them to speciate and cover the whole continent, whereas in South Africa or in Namibia, it's just the one species with a very restricted distribution. Okay, thanks, Mark. That's a, a, it's a really thorough answer. It's, it's fascinating how these things can happen in evolution that just seem almost counterintuitive. You'd yeah. expect it to be mm -hmm. more diverse there. Um, I've got a question now from Maureen Parry, who's looking to come in. Maureen, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask? Yes, I, I was so interested to see that they were thin-leaved, delicate plants living in extreme conditions. And, you know, um, I've had my mind that things adapt by having waxy cuticles and going to thorns and all the usual sort of desert plants. So it seems like it's a completely different strategy of evolution. This, what you said, I mean, this is all new to me, but a, a seed germination control evolving. So what proportion of plants, I mean, is, is there a, a lot of plants that have taken this path to evolution rather than having a physical thing, having a timed um, germination um, strategy? Yeah, I would, I would say there are not a lot of them, but this capacity for seeds to sit in the soil, as we say, in the seed bank, seed soil bank, seed soil, seed bank, <laughs> excuse me, uh, isn't something that happens just in these Nicotianas. We've got examples here in the British flora where, what was the thing that was just recently rediscovered where they'd scraped the edge of the pond and um, I forgot what it was, 
hadn't been seen for 15 or 20 years appeared again. Uh, this is this phenomenon of sitting in the soil for a long period of time is something that uh, occurs quite broadly in, in plants. But this capacity to control germination in such a way uh, as to make it more likely that you're going to be able to complete your life cycle in the, at the right time of the year, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this seems to be the innovation. And as I said, I, it doesn't make any sense uh, that these things would be so highly inhibited, uh, but there clearly is something holding back germination unless I use this plant hormone, which is known to break uh, dormancy in plants. Uh, you just can't get them to germinate. You might get the odd one or two to germinate out of planting 100, but if you're wanting to study them, you need more than that. And so I just treat them overnight with gibberellic acid and then they all germinate. So it makes it quite easy. I, anyway, so that's, that's uh, the, the um, innovation here. The, the plants that I said, usual situation in deserts is for plants to have been there before the area became arid. And this is where you find the spines, the thick cuticles, the succulents, all of these are the standard things that plants do when they have time and progressively their environment is becoming more harsh. Of course, some of them just go extinct too, but those that manage to make it develop adaptations. Uh, but these little guys, the Nicotianas have come in rather late in the story of all this and uh, have just completely gone into a new um, way of adapting to it. And one of the reasons I'm interested in this polyploidy business is that we know that evolutionary novelty is associated with this doubling of chromosome numbers. Uh, makes sense. If you've got extra copies of genes, you find new ways to use them. And this control of germination may be related to that. It's one of the questions we're following up with other kinds of studies. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Anko, got any more questions from the chat? Yeah, there are a few coming in now, but um, actually, since you just mentioned polyploidy again, um, there was a question um, in the chat from Shruti who was asking if you could explain what it is, polyploidy, very quickly. Again, it has, it has uh, more than the normal numbers of chromosomes. So it's not one or two extra, like Down syndrome, which is caused by a, a three copies of one human chromosome. These are whole sets. So instead of getting uh, the, the normal Nicotiana, which has 12 pairs of chromosomes, gets 12 of those from its mother and 12 from its father. So it has 12 pairs. These get two sets from their mother and two sets from their father. And in this case, the mother and the father are members of different species. So it's a hybrid with twice the number of chromosomes. And in animals, that doesn't usually work because you can't have uh, two copies of the Y chromosome, for example, in humans, mammals, uh, many birds. Most higher animals can't tolerate the duplication of their sex chromosomes, but plants don't have sex chromosomes. And this seems to be a fairly frequent thing through the evolutionary history of plants, and it is associated with the evolution of novelty. That is being able to do things that your ancestors couldn't do. And in this case of the, the, the Nicotianas, the tobaccos in Australia, we think the one of the hypotheses for how they managed to control the germination is they've got extra genes there, copies of those. They've got two, uh, the, uh, little duplicate versions and different from the two parents. And this gives them the chance to do something different than either of the parents could do. So this is one of the reasons why we think our, many of our crops are also polyploids because this seems to be able, they do things, produce bigger, bigger berries in strawberries. If you look at the diploid strawberries, they have tiny, like the wild strawberry, whereas our Cultivar, cultivated strawberries, which are octoploid. Uh, they have eight 
copies of the chromosomes. Uh, they, um, uh, they make these big fruits and maize, of course, produces this big ear of corn. If you look at the related wild species, they produce grains up on a tassel. What do you mean, quads? <laughs> I want to ask a question. Up on a tassel. So um, anyway, so we think for whatever reasons, there's, there's some good things associated with polyploidy. I suspect that was somebody looking to come in and ask a question. I, I suspect they weren't asking you to be quiet, Mark. I'm sure it was somebody else. Um, but but oh, whoever, whoever, whoever that was, if they want to unmute themselves and come in. Uh, awfully sorry, it was me. I was actually asking my son to be quiet because I wanted to ask a question. I didn't realise it was going to come out over here. I hadn't realised I'd unmuted myself. I was wondering what was keeping this group inside the uh, Gondwanan distribution area and it wasn't breaking out. Well, they actually do. They made it out oh, of- Oh, they do. Yeah, they, uh, there are some of the species associated with this dispersal from South America to Australia and Namibia. Some of them also reached uh, New Caledonia and uh, French Polynesia. Again, they're just single species on these islands but they're members of the same group and they achieve this, if whatever, when they moved at this point, six million years ago, they didn't move to just one of the continents, they moved to, all, to both Australia and Africa and to these islands at the same time. Again, based on these molecular clock approaches, we can get the timing of those events. So it's, uh, uh, when they go, they really go. I mean, it's, uh, we have some other, examples within Australia of some long distance dispersals. Again, if they can get across from continent to continent, you might expect them to get from the west coast of Australia to the east coast or vice versa. And we have some examples like that. So it, it's, it's, it isn't why it's all in the Southern hemisphere. Good question. Uh, uh, you know, these are all things that uh, probably we'll never know exactly because there's what kind of evidence could you gather that would uh, would tell you that it was bird's feet or that wasn't bird's feet? Um, anyway, and I see we got some questions here on the side. Uh, somebody asked, do they all contain nicotine? They all do. All these species contain nicotine. And there's one of them in particular, the one that was used for the illustration for the poster, uh, Nicotiana gossi, which is um, one of the central Australian species which has a nicotine content uh, higher than commercial tobacco, and it is chewed by the Aborigines. And if given a choice, most of them would prefer their native uh, to the commercial cigarettes. One of the park rangers at Uluru, at uh, the national park there uh, uh, in the center of Australia, said he did try at one time and basically it put him out of commission. He was a tobacco, a cigarette smoker, and he said he just put him out for 24 hours. A lot of the other chemistry, like many other Solanaceae, is hallucinogenic or, um, yeah, narcotic. Uh, and so all, many of these have been used by the, local, by the native peoples in Australia. Um, uh, and Carlo, any others in the chat you want to bring out? We've got a couple of minutes left still. Yeah, there were actually a couple that are related because you had just mentioned um, two questions ago about um, the um, dispersal of the seeds uh, via bird's feet. Um, so there were two questions kind of related to that. Uh, Mary Dean was wondering if the seeds could have been carried in the bird's um, gut. And Heather Sheely was wondering if it was possible that the distribution, if there was any distribution of these seeds on vegetative mats or rafts following sea currents. Well, the, the gut, uh, first of all, these are tiny seeds which have not a particularly thick coat. Um, it's unlikely they would survive the digestive tract of a bird. And of course, a bird uh, that goes those kind of distances is going to have eliminated whatever it took in by the time, I mean, it's usually two or three days. I suppose if they're not eating anything else, then whatever was in there would stay in there in their gut until for a longer period of time. But it's, it seems unlikely these seeds, and I don't particularly know 
they, they wouldn't, the bird would only have to accidentally ingest those seeds because there's nothing there that a bird would go after on its own. They're too tiny, uh, seems unlikely that they would be eaten. And if they were, it would be by smaller birds, which aren't the, which aren't the ones that are gonna be going across. It could be sea mats and rafting vegetation. Um, these are not particularly plants of the strand. They, they seem to be more in the interior. Now this doesn't mean that at some point they couldn't have been on the coast and then moved in inland subsequently, uh, but they're not particularly known to be, I, I've never found them on a, well, I have, I should take that back. They do occasionally occur in these coastal heaths like I showed. So uh, it's possible that I'm not gonna rule anything out. I mean, it just, uh, bird's feet seems the most likely way they managed it. It's clear they did it, but um, we can speculate. It's one of those things uh, we can use our imagination. So, um, I'll come to anchor. Is there one more you can find in there, anchor? Well, there's um, well, there are, uh, two more, so I'll, I'll do one. Um, how many of the species have been cultivated? Or is germination too difficult across the genus? The, <clears throat> the South American species are widely cultivated. There are several uh, that are grown horticulturally. You can get um, commonly uh, as hybrids, many of them. Uh, and there are several others like uh, the one, one of the parents that I showed, Nicotiana sylvestris, is commonly grown in, grown in gardens in the UK and in, in um, in the United States and Canada. And it's a species from Argentina. It's spectacular uh, six to eight centimeter more, in some cases long, uh, very sweetly fragrant at night, beautiful uh, horticultural subject. Uh, so many of them are cultivated and some of the Australian ones you can buy as seeds in the UK. One that I could highly recommend is one called Excelsior, Nicotiana Excelsior. Uh, which I grow here at home uh, every summer because it, on a warm summer's night, the most beautiful aromatic perfume you could ever imagine. And we get sphinx, sphinx moths coming to it quite often because it's one of the long tubed ones. Um, so mm -hmm. if you look uh, online, you can find Nicotiana excelsior. You can also find Suaviolans, which is another member of this group, is commonly grown as an uh, ornamental plant. So they are grown ornamentally. There are uh, three species that are grown commercially for nicotine production. Uh, Nicotiana tobaccum, which is grown for cigarettes and cigars, and then Nicotiana rustica, which is grown uh, for extraction of nicotine as a pesticide. It's so full of um, nicotine that it's, it's too harsh and nobody likes to smoke it, but it is cultivated for extraction of nicotine, uh, which is used in many, or is used as a pesticide. Um, and then uh, Nicotiana bigelovi, which is the, if you watch the Western movies where the cowboys and the Indians smoke a peace pipe, uh, what's in that peace pipe is a native Nicotiana from the Western part of North America. Hmm. Anke, you said, you said there was just one more question when, when, when I asked, asked. Let, let's take that question and then we'll have to call it a day at that point. Okay, yeah, there's one last um, from Tim Rogers who's asking if Nicotiana is a genus that um, they're, they're pioneers given the longevity in the seed bank and growth in arid areas, um, not plants that can compete very well or need disturbance to invade. That's, that's a very good description of their strategy. They're they grow where there is no competition. And again, this is part of what's made them successful. They can move into these sand dunes, to these sites that are otherwise nearly inhospitable for plants, but they can grow there because they've got their timing of the germination down so that they know they can do what they need to do to produce another generation. And the areas where they come into competition with introduced weeds, some of the brassicas um, and uh, daisy family plants that have been introduced through agriculture. Uh, when these come in, some of these can 
pulls the same trick as the Nicotianas, and these Nicotianas cannot compete with them. They just die out. So there are a lot of historical localities that are in areas where you can do some degree of uh, agriculture and the Nicotianas disappear immediately from those areas because they're not adapted to any competition <clears throat> and a bit of disturbance suits them just fine. Thank you, Mark. Well, it's been a fascinating talk. Um, I, I have learned a huge amount and not just about this specific plant, but about plant evolution and how, how they adapt. So I've really enjoyed it. I'm going to stop the recording now and